Hi, and welcome back to Publisher Nation, the official podcast of Digital Book World. We are in season two, episode five, leading up to Digital Book World 2020 this September. My name is Bradley Metrock. I'm CEO of a company called Score Publishing based in Nashville, Tennessee. And very pleased today to be talking about an issue which I just find absolutely fascinating, what we call corporate publishing, which is basically our term for non-traditional strategic types of publishing for which book sales may not be a goal at all. If they are, they may be further down the chain and there may be something else um, more important to the publisher that they're trying to achieve. Um, thrilled today to have two really interesting guests on the show. Renu, I'm going to start with you. Um, tell us who you are. Tell us who you're with. Tell us what you do. All right. Okay, cool. So I'm Ranushka. So I'm based in actually Colombo, Sri Lanka, and I work for the HSBC as a production manager. Uh, so I work for an entity called uh, Global Publishing Services, which is the in-house publishing entity of the HSBC for the entire HSBC group. Uh, so we provide a wide array of publishing services to the entire group, which involves design services, pitch book formatting, web publishing, video publishing, and even AR related uh, publishing applications. Uh, so my day-to-day -day job mainly revolves around uh, resource management, project management, and uh, stakeholder management. And in addition to that, I am uh, closely involved with the uh, R&D initiatives of my department, where we are trying to find out new and upcoming publishing technologies, which we can use within the bank to, to uh, address the various requirements of different various business entities within the bank. Um, in addition to that, I am a co-founder of an agency called Elysian Minds. Uh, we are a specialized agency for presentation design and branding, where we help corporates, individuals, and different organizations to create visually compelling, effective, and engaging presentations. In addition to that, we help the brands to, or the corporates to integrate their branding uh, in, in their publishing and activities in a very cohesive manner. So basically, that sums up everything that I do. And for people who may not be familiar, HSBC, who, who are they? Big bank, but tell us, give us a couple sentences on who they are. All right, okay. So HSBC is one of the oldest and the biggest bank in the world. And uh, we are, I cannot remember how many countries we are available at the moment because time to time it changes. Uh, so the employee base is around 250,000 employees and um, they are operating in the, wholesale, corporate banking, investment banking, private banking, you name it, everything, you name it, anything, everything they will cover in the financial services industry. Uh, the biggest markets are in obviously Hong Kong and UK, but I, I know that HSBC has presence in uh, USA as well. Uh, in my business entity, basically it goes as global publishing services. We have teams uh, based in the UK, HK, Hong Kong, and in Manila, in Guangzhou, and in Sri Lanka, and in Cairo. So those are the locations that we have our publishing teams based. Very cool. Ranu, thank you for being part of the show with us. Thank you. Thank you as well. Our second guest is Michael Kelly of Hasbro. Michael, say hello. Hello. <laughs> thank you for being part of Publisher Nation with us. Uh, so take a minute, tell us who you are, tell us who you're with, and tell us what you do. Sure. So I'm Michael Kelly. I'm the head of global publishing for Hasbro Incorporated. Um, Hasbro, most people probably know as the manufacturer of game and toy brands around the world, like Transformers, Monopoly, My Little Pony, etc. Um, so basically, if you or your children play with it as kids, then uh, most likely we had some hand in it uh, along the line. Um, my job primarily is at Hasbro, we license out our publishing. So we basically look for best in class partners around the world to bring our books to life uh, for us. Um, but obviously also in conjunction with us as we oversee things like the creative, the concept, storytelling. Um, but then we, we rely on our publishers to provide those core competencies in, in both finding talent, um, illustration and editorial services as well, not to mention sales and distribution. So it's a little bit different insofar as we're a bit arm's length from the actual book production and sales part of it. Um, but we're very much involved in the creative side of things and, and getting our stories out there. So, you know, from my perspective, Hasbro's really 
we would consider ourselves an entertainment company. Um, and we actually just recently finished the acquisition of E1 Entertainment, which added brands like PJ Masks and Peppa Pig to our portfolio. Um, so we're doing that integration now and, and taking on publishing responsibilities for that as well. Um, but our job really is to, is to fill in that storytelling and provide additional uh, points of contact for our consumers who love our shows, love our movies, love playing with the toys and, and want to get some more stories behind them and, and interact in that way. That's excellent. And I still have a big gaping hole in my soul for when Optimus Prime died in the Transformers film <laughs> uh, back in the, uh, the 80s. My entire generation was uh, corrupted by that. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Michael, for being on the show as well. And um, yeah, so we've got two guests here, one uh, deeply involved with publishing for a major international bank and the other deeply involved in publishing for a toy, a toy maker, essentially. Um, and uh, that's involved in many other aspects of, of uh, entertainment, as, as you phrased it, Michael. And um, that's a fascinating concept that, uh, that publishing is um, a critical function, uh, a strategic function of two companies that no one would ever consider a publisher. And you know, I guess to start with, you know, I, I want to get at um, this sort of the state of corporate publishing. And to do that, I think what I'll ask, uh, and Michael, I'll start with you, is that with, you know, with your role at Hasbro, do people, uh, your colleagues uh, in, in the company and maybe external stakeholders or partners, is it well understood and appreciated at Hasbro that you know that publishing and and the storytelling is a is a critical thing to be going on to further the business. Do people appreciate that uh, publishing uh, and, and corporate publishing is really important for Hasbro to continue to grow? Um, describe describe your uh, visibility and your um, I guess your your positioning within the company. Whether you're sort of viewed as you know, are they viewed as important? Are, is what you do viewed as importantly as it should be? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> well, we're never viewed as importantly as we should be right now. <laughs> no, I, 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 that is absolutely not the, the, the case at Hasbro. Hasbro has embraced publishing for, for a long time, actually, and very much understands and appreciates the value that the category and the, the medium brings to the business. So, you know, when, when Hasbro is looking at things and, you know, I, honestly, I, I could not ask to work for a better employer when it comes to recognition of the power of storytelling and what that does for brands. Um, and Hasbro has really been a thought leader, I think, in that case for quite a long time. So in, in terms of where we fit in the spectrum, you know, Hasbro is pretty famous for having what we call our brand blueprint, which is you look at the brand, say Transformers, for example, um, you see what is the core essence of that brand, and then you decide what are the ways that that brand can exist around what we call this blueprint. And, and one of the points, you know, so some of the points on the blueprint might be digital gaming. It might be toy, the actual physical toy that you play with. It might be television and uh, movie entertainment. Um, and publishing is on that wheel. It's, part, it's a segment of that, I guess we'd just say one of the spokes of that wheel. Um, and we are looked upon as a, as a part of the company that drives storytelling, that drives engagement, um, and in fact, in some cases, can even launch new brands um, or supplement brands that are, that are going through other parts of entertainment as well. So, you know, one of the ways that I always describe it in particular is one of our most successful publishing programs has historically been My Little Pony. And My Little Pony is on television every week and it's had its own theatrical movies and you know what i would say is that my job and my team's job is to tell stories about those characters that happen when they're not on television so that you the child or or the fan can watch an episode and then if they want to find out what happens the next day they read our books so it's really a key element of storytelling within what we consider to be an entertainment company in which storytelling is obviously so key so um yeah i mean uh, you know, I, I interact on a daily basis with 
um, executive team from our Hasbro studios out in Burbank um, with our toy teams, our global brand teams, uh, our digital media team. So we're all, you know, we're all basically syncing up together with our storytelling so that it's one voice, one brand and one strategic vision. With what you do at Hasbro, is it viewed as more of a, a loss leader sort of thing? Or are you responsible for specific publishing, you know, uh, profitability? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, we are, we are part of what's called the consumer products team, um, which is our licensing wing. So consumer products handles everything that Hasbro doesn't manufacture themselves. So that's everything from books on my team to t-shirts and um, hard goods, uh, you know, health and beauty, things like that. So um, we, are, we are driven by revenue, absolutely. Uh, we're a profitable business to be sure. Um, and that's an expectation. I think that with publishing, it's a, it's a dual remit. I am expected to deliver revenue, to grow my business as, as any business would be, um, but I'm likewise expected to deliver content creation and brand building as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a dual mission, um, but revenue is, yeah, I'm hundred percent expected to be profitable. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, no, that's, uh, no, that's, that's, uh, that's fascinating. And I appreciate you sharing that. And Ranu, I'm going to ask you basically the same thing to share, uh, your visibility within HSBC, um, how the rest of the company looks at this publishing function. Uh, that, that resides within it and the sort of the expectations that the company has for, for what it is that you're doing for them. All right. Okay, cool. So uh, mainly uh, within HSBC, the global publishing services, uh, we work as an internal publishing agency and uh, creativity agency as well. Uh, so our visibility, if you take mainly, we are seen by the uh, internal teams only. Uh, when you go out, let's say if we might sometimes uh, recognize a piece of work that we have done, but no one would actually realize that it was done by this particular department within HSBC, but because it goes out as a uh, HSBC product. So I completely agree with what Michael said. Uh, when we create something, there has to be a cohesion, a consistency, one brand, one story. Uh, so that is where uh, the, my department comes in as well, uh, where we uh, collaborate. So we actually collaborate with uh, the global marketing teams, the branding teams, and the investment banking teams, so various other banking teams uh, to, to meet their publishing needs. Uh, most of the publishing needs and the requirements we are getting from the, uh, the banking units uh, within, the, within the entire uh, bank uh, around the globe. Uh, in addition to that, so those are the, uh, the external requirements. In addition to that, uh, we are playing a main role in, within the internal uh, community as well, within the HSBC, because it's about 250,000 employees roughly. And so it's a size of a small town. So you need to maintain a certain level of, uh, or you need to exercise a certain level of publishing activities within this community as well. So our uh, contribution in, in terms of that area is also quite significant. Uh, so we help in both aspects for the external publication, publishing part, as well as internal publishing part. Uh, certainly there is a huge appreciation within the, uh, the bank for what we do, because, because mainly uh, it, it's not only about publishing or it's not only about, about uh, building the brand, it, it's about cost saving as well, because uh, my department, if we really look at the type of work that we do, if it were to go to an external agency, uh, the bank would have spent a huge amount of money. And internally, we save that money by sitting within the bank. In addition to that, we provide the flexibility of being available at any time and understanding the brand and how the bank works. So we are an integral part of the bank. So we understand what language they speak and what is the main focus of the bank. And when it comes to, uh, let's say, designing or producing something, we know where to focus and how to uh, get it done. Uh, so that is one part. And the other separate part that I would like to focus is the uh, information security. Because as a financial organization, we have a huge res responsibility to ensure that the information that we de deal are dealt in a, a proper and a secured manner. Uh, so within my department, there are specific processes and procedures in place to make sure that that uh, that happens because uh, we might be working with the client information. We might be working with uh, 
quite price sensitive information if when they were released uh, before the the intended time it, it can actually distort the market outside uh, so by sitting within hsbc by being the internal um, the publishing entity we can provide all these services to we can understand the branding better we can build up our stories around the brand uh, better and we can provide that uh, flexibility uh, by being available at any any time and being available within the bank uh, so they we are quite approachable plus uh, we will give or uh, we will generate more cost saving to the banks uh, plus as well as we provide that information security that is required essential for the the type of information that we handle so there's a uh, definitely there's a appreciation within the bank within the group of people that we are working for the work that we do no that's great and it's great to hear both y'all um discuss that and um and i want to ask so both of you talked about you know within your organizations the need for this unity of vision basically this consistency and approach um and uh i'm I'm intrigued on, uh, you know, I'm going to ask you and, and Renew, I'm going to start with you and then Michael go to you. Um, I, I can't imagine anything being harder than that in this pandemic, you know, because um, <laughs> you're, you're not able to meet in person. Typically, that would be something I would imagine where you're talking about, you got a publication you got to come out with, or you got some deadlines, or you, you're in the concept phase of something. And that's a, a sit down meeting would help get everybody aligned. And there is no sit down meeting right now. <laughs> Unless uh, by sit down meeting, uh, you're referring to sitting in front of Zoom for eight hours, uh, which we all uh, are uh, getting tired of doing. So Ranu, I'm gonna ask you uh, and then go to Michael, share with, share with me in, in the audience um, how the pandemic has made your job harder. Uh, I would imagine it's made it harder. If I'm wrong, correct me, but uh, share with me how it's made uh, achieving those goals that you talked about uh, more difficult. Certainly, and, and uh, there were numerous, countless challenges, to be honest. Uh, I, I can make a huge list that we can probably talk, talk about for like uh, hours and hours. Uh, so if I talk about challenges, mainly, um, the challenge that actually you mentioned earlier that sitting around the table and brainstorming and uh, having that uh, connection interaction with the people that that is certainly we are missing that part of the uh, that that aspect of our interaction because uh, in in my job role i have to work with a lot of creative people and we have to do a lot of uh, brainstorming and and sometimes sitting in a room and having uh, those papers whiteboards and throwing out ideas it, it 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 will be much much easier for us to produce something but uh, situation is such that we have to somehow overcome these uh, challenges and we have to find new methods new ways of working uh, in a way it came to us quite naturally as well because as i said we have teams around the world we are not based in one location and we are on a daily basis we are connecting with our colleagues in the other location so for an example let's say sometimes we might have a project uh, that will be carried out simultaneously in two locations in that case the teams are expected to connect and we were already using uh, zoom and various other technologies available uh, so the teams and uh, the colleagues basically they were already familiar with the type of technology and how to address this kind of a scenario but uh, the biggest challenge that came were uh, due to the environmental change and the techni technological changes i guess because at office we have we are not getting distracted and we have our complete attention and complete availability for whatever that we do but when we are working from home it's it's completely different you can get distracted at any given time for anything it can be the weather it can be a a, a dog barking on the <laughs> other house it can be a family member shouting <laughs> it can be anything and plus the technology also does not help all the time uh, like you mentioned at the beginning of this call that uh, the zoom can be a troublemaker at some time so we faced it many many times and 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 there was a there was a certain phase that we had to switch off the videos when we are looking into the calls because certainly the calls couldn't go through with the videos on so there were such challenges plus uh, 
the type of that we the work that we do requires a, a strong internet connection sometimes uh, in certain areas and at certain time of the day might not be available so people have to go online and offline time to time uh, but I think where we found the solution and how we overcame all these challenges were the uh, the planning, the communication, and the coordination. I think those are the three main aspects that helped us to overcome all these challenges. Uh, because uh, by being a global organization, having people working across various locations from uh, in Manila, in Colombo, in Cairo, London, Hong Kong, everywhere. Uh, and in, in different time zones as well. And uh, we are in, in certain uh, areas, we uh, run 24 seven operation in, uh, in, in, within our department even. So it, it's quite challenging as well. So you have to have a, a better planning and a coordination and most importantly, the communication. So the teams, I think, get together and they came up with uh, pretty innovative ways as well. Things that we hadn't done earlier, things we, that we thought would not happen uh, within the bank. We saw that was happening, especially the entire bank to go uh, working from home. Uh, initially, we earlier we had a huge concern about the security of information. As I said, that we are working with financial organization, we are working with sensitive and financial related data, and uh, it has always been a concern for us. But uh, we found out new methods how to ensure, how to make sure that the information is being uh treated in the same way how it is being treated at office even if you are working from home uh, so what helped us doing that is uh, better communication um, with the teams uh, with the management and uh, with the entire organization plus uh, planning and the coordination perfect yeah no that's great uh, that's, a, that's a lot of insight and michael i'm going to ask you the same question um how you know you you've got to coordinate uh the the creative vision on across all these brands and these characters and the you know what are you going to you know what narrative arc are you going to take with with this universe and and what new you know what do we want to do with this property over here how has the pandemic made all of that process more challenging for you well i would say you know, in some ways, it hasn't had a huge effect, to be honest, which is probably not what you expected to hear. But um, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that I'm, my team and I are already accustomed to working remotely for the most part, to be honest. I mean, even though we're, you know, there's some of us based in Hasbro's headquarters in Rhode Island, uh, my team spread across five continents and the various divisions of, of Hasbro occupy different parts of the globe as well. And so, you know, we, we basically were already used to doing a lot of our meetings and our conversations virtually anyway. So in that regard, it, it hasn't had that much of an effect. I will say that certainly there's been some impact in terms of the, the sort of impromptu water cooler conversations, if you will, that would happen in any office environment. And that's tough, you know, because sometimes the best ideas come outside of meetings and in those sort of chance meetings in the hallway. Um, but you know, we basically just had to take more of a proactive look at setting aside time to talk about those creative things, to brainstorm, and, and also to bring ideas that we have when we're offline to the table when we, when we are actually together uh, virtually. You know, I think the thing that we are missing the most, honestly, is those roll up your sleeves meetings where you actually go to a publisher and sit down and talk about a, a plan for the year. Um, you know, again, we're able to do that virtually, but, you know, you, th there is a little bit of challenge in doing it when you don't have that instant rapport that you develop when you're in person. You know, frankly, the, the pandemic for us has been, it's more, again, because we are a retail product, um, that has really been the impact, obviously, you know, with the shutdowns and, and the various slowdowns of, of distribution, et cetera, we, you know, I think what I would say is the good news is we've never had a demand problem. There's always been demand for our products throughout the pandemic. And, and in fact, demand for our books is as high as ever, if not higher. I think the problem obviously has been, it's tough to get them into the hands of people when bookstores are closed and, and distribution channels slow down. Um, so we're seeing improvement there now. Um, and we certainly had to adapt and, and look at different ways of getting stories into the hands of the people who want to read them. Um, but, you know, in terms of general communication, it's been, it's been a bit of a mix, but, um, but again, because of the global nature of our business, just not maybe as much of an impact as, as some other people have had to manage. 
Interesting. Yeah, no, I appreciate both of y'all sharing that. I'm going to shift gears for a second. Uh, and Michael, I'll start with you with this. Um, and I want to ask you uh, just broadly, the best use of technology that you have seen in publishing um, or associated with publishing uh, recently. So it could be something that uh, was part of the marketing of a property. It could be something uh, operationally, uh, anywhere up and down the chain, best use of technology you've seen within publishing uh, that's top of mind for you. Yeah, for, so for me, I would say, you know, again, and I think this is, a, this is distinctly an experience from the pandemic, um, is with the, with the increase in home learning and the fact that parents are really needing to educate their kids in their own households while they're also trying to do their jobs at the same time in many cases, has has really required a different form of of business and technology and you know one of the things that i've been really excited to see is is how many publishers and have have really adapted to that challenge and the ability to deliver supplemental learning materials to parents um so that their kids can thrive in this in this challenging environment and you know we've we've really tried to to look at our own brands and our own publishing program and see where we can be part of that solution as well and help out in, in a case where, you know, and I know I'm going through this myself with my own kids that it's, you know, they're, they're home, they're, you know, the, the online learning is, is doing, is, is fine for its part, but you know, it's obviously different from being in a classroom. And so how do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them interested? And uh, you know, that, that use of delivering educational storytelling and supplemental materials digitally um, and through au digital audio as well, um, I think it's been a really great development from, from the current situation. Yeah, we're going through it as well. Uh, my wife and I have an eight-year-old son and, you know, the, uh, I mean, it's a weird world right now. You know, you want, uh, you want him getting the socialization uh, from being around uh, other children, um, but uh, you certainly don't want him getting sick and you don't want anyone else getting sick. And meanwhile, as you spoke to, the, the, the need for educational resources is, uh, you know, out of the home um, has never been higher. And um, just quality, access to quality um, learning. And uh, yeah, so I, I, that's, that's, uh, that's well taken. Radu, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Um, give me the best uh, or most top of mind example of uh, applying technology to publishing that you've seen lately. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to divide my answer into two because I am, I, I would like to uh, give it in two different ways. My choice before the pandemic and my choice after the pandemic, <laughs> because uh, it, the pandemic is a quite unique situation, a once in a lifetime kind of a situation that was created for all of us. And we have never experienced anything like this and it's global and it was felt and experienced everywhere the same, I guess. So before the pandemic, uh, my idea was the best tools or the use of publishing technology or the new tools would be publishing for touch base or the smart devices and augmented reality. And I am a huge fan of the new technology and especially the augmented reality. And uh, within my department as well, we have been working on different products and the services for the bank. And we have even released certain products. And there are so many amazing tools out there like Panda Suite, TouchCast. There are so many other tools that you can actually use in, in, in this area. Uh, but after the pandemic, what I realized is... Uh, it, it's something going back to the basics of the human nature or what actually people appreciate. It's, I think, the connection, the human to human connection that we have. So the best use of technology I have seen uh, in publishing or in any way, I think how people started using social media to interact with people and make sure that we can, we connect with each other, we share information and and even use social media to conduct their day-to-day -day business activities as much as possible. And uh, there were so many events that were canceled or postponed. Plus at the same time, there was a significant amount of events that moved online into uh, being webinars or into being uh, Zoom meetings like this. 
So I, I, I was very fascinated to see how actually the corporates and the individuals, organizations, everyone started using social media to keep in touch and even to conduct their events and share knowledge. And, and I think uh, this resonates with uh, up to some extent what Michael said that uh, the learning aspect of it. Uh, similarly, there were so many webinars I saw that various organizations uh, organizations organized, corporates, and then they try to make sure that their events go ahead at least in that form. Uh, and, and as humans, I think we all have that innate desire to absorb information, consume information, and learn. And uh, a lot of brands and the corporates understood this requirement. Uh, so the best use I saw during the pandemic is how people actually uh, evolved, not evolved, I would, I would say, uh, how people actually found out new ways, uh, a new perspective to use social media for different various activities. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, typically social media is look, looked at uh, cynically, you know, like uh, something that... Uh, uh, hey, I wish that were part of my life less. Um, but uh, that's not what you're saying at all. That's a, that's 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 a very interesting answer. And I I kind of agree with you. You know, like we we've, we've sort of um, at least for the most part of what I've observed is people have become a, maybe incrementally more patient with each other. You know, on social media and and just an understanding that everyone's looking at it all the time, which is not you know pre pandemic wasn't necessarily the case for everybody. That's really interesting. Um, I appreciate both of y'all sharing your thoughts on that. I want to conclude the show uh, by asking both of you, and Ronu, I'll start with you and then go to Michael, um, to get your crystal ball out, put your Nostradamus hat on. You know, just basically we're at the halfway point of the year. Um, feels like the first half of 2020 was several millennia in length. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're halfway through the year into the second half of 2020. Give me one trend that you expect to play out involving, in a broad sense, publishing and technology over the second half of 2020 into, 2020, into 2021. Okay, I think... Uh, um... If I predict, if I consider, uh, most of the things will start go online rather than being printed or being uh, published and uh, distributed physically. There's a huge trend to things to go online and uh, to disseminate the information in the form of videos. Uh, because video being more engaging and easy to consume as well. Uh, because let's say we are all stuck in, 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 in this unique situation. We are flooded with a lot of information and we have to consume a lot of information as well to make sure that we get our day-to-day -day work done. Plus we maintain our uh, uh, personal relationship with the outside, the outside world as well. Uh, so we need to manage our time and videos provide us that flexibility uh, to make sure that we consume that information faster and effectively. And at, at, at the same time, it, it provides the, uh, the communicator or the, the person who is presenting the information, uh, various other ways, different creative ways to present their information. Plus it will be coupled with uh, information going online, I guess, because uh, it, it's something again created by this pandemic situation. Um, I, I can't actually imagine how it would be, would have been if it was in maybe in 80s or early 90s where we did not have internet or World Wide Web or any of these technologies. Uh, fortunately, we have all these technologies and it has connected the world in a manner that even though we are physically distant, we can still feel the presence of the people. We can still communicate with the people. And up to some extent, we are able to uh, continue with our business activities. That is what we actually saw during the pandemic because we thought that a lot of businesses would fail and there will be huge crisis. I, I know that there, is a, there are difficulties and there are uh, negative uh, predictions about the economic development and all that, but yet I think a lot of business organizations found new ways to continue, proceed uh, their business activities. They found new ways. I, I think that's, that's part of being human as well. That's, that's part of our nature to evolve and 
find out our own solution whenever there is a challenge. So I think uh, from 2022, 2021, I see video as being um, uh, become more popular plus everything will become more digitized and will become more online no that's great and uh you know it seems like such a foregone conclusion that yeah things will go online but the reality is as both of you well know there's plenty more room <laughs> to go um you know in bringing things online and um yeah so that's really interesting michael same because, question uh, for you oh go ahead. even if you if you even uh, visit a, a branch, a bank branch, different it, it varies from uh, the different bank to bank and different, probably from different uh, region to region. You will see a lot of papers lying around, a lot of printed material lying around. Even I enjoy the feel of the book and I, I, I prefer reading a book rather than reading it over Kindle Low over my iPad. But uh, I situation is such, I think the main focus or moving forward, the evolution will be towards uh, things being digital. Yeah, and certainly you have to give that some fresh thought. You know, it's 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 not muscle memory writing anymore. It's everything has to be very intentional um, in deciding what's going to be print and tactile and what's going to be online and, and virtual. Michael, Correct. same question for you. Um, Nostradamus hat on, crystal ball out. Hit us with a trend that you expect to see play out over uh, the rest of 2020 into 2021. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's, I wish I really could do that because make things a lot easier. But, uh, you know, I mean, just looking at what, both what's happening and, and you know, just from experience of, of basic social unrest and concerns in the past, you know, I think as things get challenging and as the world becomes a more confusing place, uh, you know, people tend to, people tend to want to look for what is comfortable and what is familiar and what brings back good memories. Um, and I think that you'll see a lot of increase in, in focus on nostalgia. And, and you know, from, from my perspective, certainly, you know, brands that we have that parents grew up with that they can now share with their children. And, you know, I think, you know, certainly I think that, you know, Rano's point is well taken. And I think that he's absolutely right in terms of digital, but I think I would just add a note of caution to that, that I think especially as more and more of a child's time is taken up with screens, when their school, in fact, is now going to be in part at least run through through online experiences, I think you may find that there is a, a bit of uh, desire to get away from screen time and, and look for other forms of, of maybe more um, just more hands-on and more physical activities than the digital experience. So I do think that there, that we'll see a, a, an increase in, in reading of physical books. I think we'll see an increase of, of playing board games and things of that nature that we're already seeing as families look to spend time together and, and look for ways to keep their families entertained and happy. And, you know, and just to, to escape for a little while from, from these challenging times that are going on in the world around us. So, you know, from my perspective, it's really about making sure that while we're there for those digital needs, whether it be learning or entertainment, we're also recognizing that people need a break from that digital experience and that they need that physical hands-on experience. And, and, you know, and really looking to what is it that makes a family come together? What makes people feel like they're part of a community and that they have a shared experience? That's, yeah, that's excellent. Uh, and, uh, you know, speaking to that, uh, so my wife and son and I played Go Fish last night for the first time in, I can't tell you, I, maybe possibly ever. Uh, I lost, by the way. Uh, no need to ask. Uh, I lost. Um, I'm still mad. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I, gentlemen, I appreciate y'all taking the time. And, uh, you know, Ranu and Michael, y'all both uh, sit in very different places, but um, you've got very interesting line of sight on <clears throat> this, this uh, interesting sort of evolution of publishing to where publishing is now part of companies that are not publishers. Uh, and you're, it's something you're thinking about, uh, you know, every day, every, every month, every quarter. Uh, and so uh, thank you for being part of the show with us. Thank you for taking the time to share not only your experience, but your expertise with, with me and the audience as well. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you for having us as well. You got it. For Publisher Nation, Season 2, Episode 5, thank you for listening or watching if you're watching on YouTube. Until next time.